Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me. Not ideal uh, to be doing this online, but um, as everyone is adapting during COVID-19, so am I. So here's my virtual sabbatical talk. Uh, and before I start, I wanna thank the Center for Rhetoric and Society at Virginia Tech. Um, I was a uh, scholar in residence there where I did this research in spring 2019. Thank you, Katie, and the grad students there. I wanna also thank Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, the ghost writer um, who I interview here. Uh, and I also wanna thank the Moton Museum for being so open to allowing me to do research. And uh, lastly, Towson, thank you, Towson University for continued support. So my talk is Ghost Writing for Racial Justice on Barbara Johns, Speech writing and critical imagination, a culmination for me of years of my work as an advocate for social and racial justice. And please go on my academia.edu site if you want to read some of my work. Bit about me, uh, got my PhD in cultural rhetoric from Syracuse and returned to my hometown. So I have a, a really um, kind of special relationship with the the city where I work here and um, focus a lot on giving back to the city that is too often forgotten. You can read uh, my case study in attempting to return stolen things, which is on my academia site, um, about uh, the work that I do in my GIVE project, Grant Writing and Valued Environments project at TU. Um, and to these ends, I hope people at Towson um, continue to do that good social racial justice work and recognizing that um, Towson used to be in West Baltimore and uh, we're really doing hard work in up at Towson to try to give back and um, create more racial justice. So um, with that said, that drive my research tonight, how does a writer go about recreating historical speeches? That is, if a speech is not available but you wanted to study a speech, how would you do that if there's no transcript of it in the historical record at all? How does a writer reimagine it so it can be part of the record? Secondly, how can this method of reimagining help us continue to refigure our cultural heritage? I will share the conclusions I gained from my interview with Dr. Newby Alexander of an early civil rights speech she rewrote or reimagined and um, talk about how these histories require imagine, imaginative reconstruction for tonight. So I can keep you awake here. I've given you signposts to look out for. Part one, background and history. I'll tell you the story of the speech that Barbara Johns gave. Um, next, I'll talk about some writing history problems, historiographic, the, the writing of history and how it's problematic, leaves, most, leaves out a lot of things. And the Third part is core data, the actual interview that I did with Dr. Nubi Alexander. You will hear the actual speech as it was reimagined. And part four, we take uh, our discussion into the classroom where I uh, took the research here and reimagined it as pedagogy for students that did amazing work. Part five, finally, I want you to please uh, email me questions or comments. Okay, so history. Well, a semester at Virginia Tech in spring 19, I found my way across the state, past the signs for the Harry F. Byrd Highway, if you don't know him, a virulent racist from Virginia and a senator, past senator. So I uh, went past those signs, quite shocked, past many a cow pastures to the Robert R. Moton Museum, pictured here on the right. In the middle, right in the middle of the state of Virginia stands this beautiful monument to civil rights and to the Prince Edward County fight for student freedom that lasted from 1951 all the way through to 1964. Though some say the fight never ended, the site of the Moton Museum is where the Moton High School stood. You can see it there in the back, where 16-year-old, here's my star of, of this talk, 16-year-old Barbara Johns led a historic walkout and strike in 1951 to protest unequal conditions. There's Barbara Johns on the left. Neat. She was the niece of the fiery minister and avid civil rights advocate Vernon Johns, who was known as the father of the civil rights movement and as the apostle of armed resistance. Some may know Vernon Johns, Barbara's uncle, 
as the man who preceded Dr. King as pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. He also led an uncompromising campaign for civil and human rights and had preached many progressive radical sermons that um, his niece, Barbara Johns, no doubt heard, such as the ironic, sarcastic, sardonic, uh, in-your-face sermon called, It is Safe to Murder Negroes in Montgomery. And on the right, you see a protest sign from the 1951 strike that Barbara led. On April 23rd, 1951, Barbara Johns, delivering a sobering speech to the student body of Moton High School in Prince Edward County, Virginia, catalyzed a walkout and strike to protest inferior conditions, which were reprehensible in relation to what the all-white school had in Farmville, Virginia, on the right. Overcrowding, disrepair, leaks, holes in the roof, inadequate heat, inadequate transportation to school, low wages, a general lack of resources. But the walkout and the strike that lasted for two entire weeks was not all that was accomplished. The student wrote this letter on the left that you see here. To secure the support of the NAACP, the students went on to be part of the filing of Davis v. Prince Edward County, which became the only student-led initiative consolidated into the landmark Brown versus Board of Education. And although the Moton students had received a new building two years later after the strike in 1953, these federal civil rights victories made white people resist more, which led to a policy by, uh, authored by Byrd. In 1956, Virginia adopted massive resistance policy the movement took shape in Prince Edward County when the white-led school board closed all public schools rather than integrate them. To circumvent federal law, what the white people did was they diverted funds from the closed public schools and then opened up with that money an all-white private school, while black students in the county were left without state-supported education for five years. To fill the gap where only the most fascist states in the world failed to provide free education to youth, the black communities rallied to create Prince Edward County Free School Association. And finally, in 1964, a Supreme Court decision ruled against the school board and ordered the opening and integration of all county schools. So that's some of the history and background in brief. There's way more to know, but that's about all I can cover here. And we'll now move on to the historiographic problems. And so, part two. So it may come as no surprise that the walkout that Barbara Johns led and the speech that she delivered to over 400 of her peers was not recorded. By the early 1950s, we had only just begun what's called the magnetic era in sound recording, in which bulky magnetic tape recorders, like the one you see on the left, became the norm for consumer and broadcasting markets, but likely would not have been available to students at Moton. So it was curious to me as I began to learn more about this lesser known part of civil rights histories, that not only was there no audio, but the original transcript of John's speech was nowhere to be found. So how does a researcher look at it? How does a researcher analyze a speech when there is no uh, evidence left of the speech? Whether it be text, handwritten, um, like this on the right that you see, a page from her diary, which did not include any transcript from the speech, unfortunately. So as I embarked on a probe into this exciting her story that points to an earlier date of the civil rights movement, historiographic grooves emerged. And as Tonia Sutherland writes, we need to resist giving amnesty to history. She writes, she calls to quote archivists and researchers to work against white supremacist bias by refusing to accept that gaps and vagaries in the historical record are accidental or coincidental but are instead an extension of clemency and amnesty. Archivists and researchers can better address these gaps and vagaries. And as N.D.B. Conley writes in his Black Power Method, who gets to become an archivist? How do archives get organized and what counts as an archive? All has a profound racial impact on what endures as valued historical research. Expansive digital archives can still be locked behind paywalls or library turnstiles at elite universities. Brick and mortar archives stand in racially segregated parts of town and in the most concrete ways possible, really important here, 
racial politics determine how we locate the past. That is, I discovered I could, in fact, access Barbara Johns's transcript from the speech, but it had to be through oral performance tradition, not from a regular archive. So I um, did a lot of digging and finally found my ghostwriter and um, accessed a documentary film um, only accessible for educational purposes made in 2012 by Tim Reed. You may know the actor director Tim Reed. He made a, uh, a documentary um, about the walkout. So no transcript. Uh, a ghostwriter did in fact write the speech and here you have a, an image of um, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, uh, a Norfolk, Virginia na native, she is the ghostwriter of the speech. And it took me a lot to track her down. I thank the people at uh, Moton Museum for that. Um, so uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Reed had reached out to Newby Alexander, a very accomplished and respected historian, as you can see, to author a version of John's speech, since there was no actual uh, transcript to be accessed. And We'll get into the actual speech itself in the interview. This is this is the good stuff here. Um, some behind the scenes from the reenactment of the uh, Tim Reed documentary. So just briefly, please watch this with me. You'll see the students all gathering to protest and you'll notice Barbara Johns behind the podium or at least a replica of Barbara Johns. And I'll skip forward towards the end. Okay, and now we have the speech itself that was written by Cassandra Newby Alexander, and this is a performance, uh, and and it is uh, read by performance spoken word artist Amuche, and so I'll let you hear this, and then we'll I'll talk about the method and um, what we can glean from this work. I said I would like all the teachers to leave the auditorium now. May I have your attention, please? Fellow students, many of you know me. I am Barbara Johns. For too long, we have quietly accepted the hand-me-downs that end up in this school. I say no longer. My uncle, Dr. Vernon Johns, always told me that all right-minded people must stand up and demand that they will no longer remain second-class citizens. For years... Our parents, teachers, ministers, and community leaders have tried to convince the school board to provide us with a decent place to learn. Some of you don't know how bad our school is compared to even other colored schools. 
I've been to Huntington High School and Newport News and Sam and Russell High School in Lawrenceville, and I can tell you that we've been given crumbs from the table. These schools have cafeterias, lockers, showers, a gymnasium, and even enough classrooms for all of their students. Some of them even have science labs and a boiler room to heat the entire school. And what do we have? We have leaky roofs, wood-burning stove, and an overcrowded classrooms. How can we sit back and be satisfied? Farmville High School sits a few blocks away, but it might as well be in another country. What the county leaders provide the white students is what we can only dream of at Robert R. Morton High School. There are some who tell us that we should be content with what we have. That someday in the future things will be better. When will that day happen? For five years, Superintendent McElwain promised that we would have a new school, but for us here in Farmville, the money is never there while it's poured into white schools. Some of our boys from the vocational program visited the shop at Farmville High. I heard them talking about that school and how angry they were at all of the equipment, supplies, and space there. For days, I laid in bed thinking how unfair it was. And then I remembered the most dangerous thing we can do is sit back and say that we have no problem. I've prayed for help and decided that it was time to strike. Three years ago, when the adults confronted the school board about the continuing delay about the rebuilding of our school, what happened? What did they give us? Tar paper shacks? That is what they make chicken coops out of. Are we animals deserving nothing better than a chicken coop? As citizens, don't we deserve better? Yes. Do you want to spend the rest of your high school years trying to learn in overcrowded classrooms and tar paper shacks? No. Why should we shiver in class with coats on or have to use umbrellas in the classroom when it rains? While the other students are surrounded by warm, clean, dry, modern brick buildings. Why should we have to leave school an hour early every day because we have so few buses that are small, secondhand, and hardly run? Why do we have to crowd into this school while on the other side of town, white students have lockers and adequate heating and a cafeteria and all that is expected of a public school? Aren't you tired of these conditions? Yes. Aren't you tired of us getting all these broken down desks and warm books? Yes. Who will come to our rescue? Not the white people of this town. Do they care about us? No. Not the teachers, whose jobs depend on their acceptance of this unequal system. And it can't be our parents because they are at risk if they challenge how we are treated in this town. That's enough, young lady. Now listen to me, students. I know you are upset, but I want each and every one of you to go back to your classrooms. Picking the school would not solve your problems. Let me and your parents work this problem out with the school admin officials. Now I want you to return to your classrooms now. Maybe we need to go back to our classrooms. Come on, let's go. Please. I want all of you to hear what I have to say, my fellow students. It is we who must come to our own rescue. We are the future of the colored race. We must find within ourselves the courage to say no to those who say we must remain content with these conditions. Our parents tell us to be good students. In church, we are told to read the Bible. The Bible says that a little child will lead. I say that now it is the time that children must lead. But what can we do? If our parents can change things for us, what makes you think we can because I believe that God is on our side. And the Bible says that we must take our inheritance. I believe our inheritance includes decent schools that are just as good as the schools here in Prince Edward County. Weren't we taught that the Declaration of Independence says all of us are created equal? It's time we stood up and made people in Farmville listen to us. Why should we join you? What if they take us to jail? The Farmville jail is not big enough to hold all of us. And if you would join with me, together we can challenge these injustices. Only with one voice can we hope to change the system. Together, we can show the world that we will no longer live like slaves in America. 
We will no longer suffer in silence with injustice all around us while whites blindly ignore our misery and yet pledge liberty and justice for all. I call upon you, my classmates, to step out with the courage and the belief that God is on our side. Let the people here in Prince Edward County hear our cries. I believe the others will join us. The NAACP may come. And once they see how determined we are not to fear and never give up until we have equality in our schools, we must have no fear. Let our action be a symbol for others. But it's only together that we can achieve this goal. Join me and let us make for a better future. Don't be afraid. We must walk out. We must walk out now and not come back until the school board honors our promises. We must strike for a better education. Follow us. Just follow us out now. I said I would like all the teachers. Okay. That was uh, Amuche and the brilliant uh, spoken word artist. Um, thank you so much. And so next I want to explain. So I, you know, interviewed Dr. Nubi Alexander about how she created that speech, how she wrote, re-envisioned that speech, uh, not having any kind of traditional evidence to use. Um, of course, she did a, a, some oral histories and um, so interviewing of the family members. And so here's uh, what I extrapolated from her method. And I'm going to play after this a few uh, clips from the interview that I did with her. Um, first, um, in order to, this is in order to develop a complex understanding of um, who the person was combined with a deep rendering of historical context. That is what Dr. Nubi Alexander says is the point, the main point that a writer needs to focus on when re, uh, reimagining a speech. Number one, you identify main motivating factors. What did they do? Why did they do what they did? Number two, you identify main influences. Who most influenced them? Three, spend time with the people who were closest to them. Four, gather and absorb sources. Five, attempt to channel them. And six, take leaps. So let's listen to what Dr. Nubi Alexander had to say. Right. And so I read all of that, and I remember thinking, okay, so this is kind of giving me an understanding of what happens overall, but it's not telling me what she said. It's not telling me what her what what motivated her because she was a very quiet, studious, unassuming individual. A rabble rouser, you know, you kind of expect this from rabble rouser, but <laughs> that wasn't her. And so, um, there was some mention, I think, by her when I was reading, talked about how her uncle was, um, had influenced her, that she had had conversations with him when he visited them. Right. So I looked up information about her uncle, and I started reading some things that he said, and it just, it, it, the, the, the discussion about her and what she did with her uncle, I realized she was very much influenced by him, that what his position on things was resonated with her in a way that this probably motivated her to do what she did. Not that he was in control of any of this, but rather he inspired her. Okay, so that was Dr. Nubi Alexander talking about how she uh, needed to focus on what influenced the the speaker. And next, everything else was from other people. And next is. Uh, Dr. Nubi Alexander talking about, this is probably uh, my favorite segment, is to her talking about channeling and how that works in uh, reimagining re someone's words. And so I took that, and in a kind of weird way, it, I almost felt like I was channeling her, the memory of what she did as I wrote this. I just, I felt, I felt like, I had got all the pieces together, and I wrote from what I could, I 
didn't understand about who she was because nobody had recorded it. You know, they only mentioned, you know, that she had excused the teachers from the room. And I thought, given her, how she was, how would she have actually asked them to speak to them? So, so much of this, I mean, you know, stories don't have an opportunity to be historically creative. Right. That's even a word. Um, I knew I had to take some real serious things. Um, but strangely, I felt comfortable doing that once I read all I could about her and about her uncle and about the world in which she lived and the people who lived around her. And I, I listened to some of the interviews from her brother and sister and people that she I felt like I had gotten close to her in some way, close to understanding who she was. All right. So, Dr. Nubi Alexander, in terms of getting getting to know people around the subject and quote unquote channeling them, yeah. uh, is her Dr. Nubi Alexander commenting on how to um, how to really figure out why someone did what they did. So let's listen here and to talk to those who are around them. And so mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able to actually attend the debut of the film. I knew her brother and sister were there and some of the friends and so forth. And I was so ecstatic when I heard that they were saying, yeah, that's how it happened. Yeah, wow. that's what <laughs> I thought that was pretty strange, but then, uh, you know, I, I, um, I was happy that somehow I was able to, to capture her essence and, and to, to capture to some degree who she was as an individual. Right. And so I hope that that was, I know that was a, a kind of a short version. Because, I mean, it, it, it did take a few weeks of me doing a deep dive into all the material and really kind of trying to get into her head. Um, to, because I'm, I'm always asking the question, why? Why would a person do this? What, what motivated that person to do this? Who was that person? How would they have actually... And, 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 you know, the more you, you read the words of the people who are around her, because as in any family group, you don't have, they were educated people, so you don't have one sibling talking very differently from the other. You know, most of the time, these siblings were close, so most of the time there was a, there's a similarity in the rhythm of their voices and the rhythm of how they frame things and say things. And so I use that to kind of inform the way that I thought she would say what she said in general. <laughs> and so. And lastly, as all good historians do, we uh, take leaps. So here's the last clip from uh, my interviewee. I felt that she was a very respectful person. And so the challenge was how do I get her to say, get out the room? Right. <laughs> you know, without, right. that's not what she would say. Right. And, and how would this young girl be able to convince teachers yeah. to lead? And so that was a real challenge. I, I, okay, so. Dr. Nubi Alexander and the, the method that she used, uh, as I said earlier, identified main motivating factors. Why did they do what they did? Who influenced them? Spend time with people who knew them. Gather and absorb sources. Attempt to channel them. And finally, take leaps. That was the culmination there of what, what, of what then became this brilliant speech. So lastly, I'm moving to the Sorry, last before the conclusion, actually, the ghostwriting in my classroom that I did, I wanted to share a few 
instances of that with you. I chose uh, a, to do this through a mini workshop with my graduate students. We chose a historical event and a central character. I told them that I preferred it, it, it be a real person. Um, fictional could work as well. Um, and try to keep it within the, the framework of what we had discussed, which was silence and gaps in history. Uh, so a few examples I gave them before they went to work on recreating the speech of a, un, a, of a silenced historical figure was one example. The event is Pericles' actual funeral and Aspasia's giving the eulogy to her ex-lover. Another example, Abraham Lincoln was shot by his wife, not by Booth. And the speech is her confession and apology. Another example of re historical imagination. Historians recently found a speech written by Phyllis Wheatley, the 18th century poet that condemns, the speech condemns her mistress for enslaving her. Final example of uh, historical reimagination. Oprah is entering the presidential race and giving a speech to the nation announcing her candid candidacy. So I'll share with you just two examples briefly of uh, this historical reimagining that my students um, the example one, I have a student who um, discussed the historical figure Kitora Rani Chenamami, Chenamama, um, Chena, sorry, Chenaama, 19th century queen in Mysore, India, and uh, the student recreated uh, this queen speaking to her army before going into a battle against the British East Indian Company. Fellow citizens and warriors of Kitora, Ready yourself to spill your blood for your worthy land, for they cannot take what truly was never theirs to begin with, for Kitor. Um, and the second example, a student uh, reimagined Willa Brown Coffee to her fellow 99s. This was a group of female pilots in 1944, um, and she recreated a eulogy for Amelia Earhart that started out, cry if you must, my sisters, but then lift your eyes to the horizon and be the next link in the chain. So just two quick examples of uh, pedagogical um, extrapolations of this research that I did. Students did a great job here. There were many more that I couldn't fit on this page. So finally, uh, and my first uh, major conclusion is that Barbara Johns, Barbara Rose Johns Powell was an early originator of the civil rights movement and she should be honored and remembered for that as well as for being largely responsible for one of the cases that was consolidated into Brown v. Board. We look at sort of the history of what came before and after Barbara Johns. So many things came, uh, she, her speech came before many events, even in the early civil rights history. Um, 1951 was Barbara Johns, so before in uh, 1955 was Claudette Colvin arrested for bus segregation, 1957, the Little Rock Nine. 1960, Ruby Bridges to integrate the all-white school in New Orleans. Uh, 1960 was John Lewis and Diane Nash in the Nashville sit-ins and SNCC. Um, one of the things we may, if we know anything about civil rights, uh, modern civil rights before 1951, we may know the journey of reconciliation freedom rides. 1947 predated the freedom rides of the 60s. Taylor Brantz really sums it up, I think, here uh, well. And he writes that uh, had the student strike begun 10 or 15 years later, Barbara Johns would have become something of a phenomena in the public media. In that era, however, the case remained muffled in white consciousness and the schoolgirl origins of the lawsuit were lost as well on nearly all black folks outside of Prince Edward County, Virginia. But today, we remember Barbara Johns as an originator, early, early originator of the civil rights movement. So some uh, other conclusions just briefly for you, uh, that we must work harder to identify lesser known histories so we can continue to refigure our cultural heritage. We must credit Johns in order to not, in order to avoid an archival amnesty where we give Prince Edward County, Virginia, Prince Edward County, Virginia School Board amnesty. We don't want to do that. Um, we want to continue to consciously and earnestly dislodge a white supremacist bias by refusing to accept the gaps and vagaries in the historical record. When we meet them, we need to figure out methods to um, recover them. This means employing methodologies like the one I've detailed here that constructs a more complete history and most importantly, shifts us away from a dominant white center. 
ghostwriting and imaginative reconstruction serve important social justice aims, I hope I've proven to you, both in and out of the classroom, where there are gaps and silences which need to be filled. And um, what's been presented here is compelling evidence, I hope, that scholarly and pedagogical attention to speeches is still worth the fruits it can bear. So um, I'll leave you, so leave you there. There is still hope for rhetoric teachers. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you very much. I'd like to move page, which you can refer to, and thanking Barbara Johns um, and for holding us up to uh, an ideal that we still strive to reach. Um, so thank you all for coming. And um, if you have questions or comments, I'd appreciate those so much. Please email me.